Okay, um, another uh, talk on the, you know, just sprinkled in between all the great insect uh, presentations, something entirely not dealing with insects. Um, I should mention here my collaborator, um, uh, Meg Daly, uh, who is in fact the curator at the building, or curator, does most of our research on sea anemones, which makes her a logical choice for curating the crayfish, since we don't have anybody else. She also does fish and uh, higher vertebrates, I think. Um, <coughs> what I wanted to talk about uh, just a little bit is about two groups that we're going to be looking at for, uh, for this project. It's my group, mites and uh, crayfish. So let's start off with the mites. Uh, before we heard, have been hearing all these great stories about fantastic collections that started in the mid-19th century, well, that's not for mites. This collection was started in the 40s, and that is considered as seriously old for mites. Uh, and it does have a history that's completely different from anything else we've had. This was a teaching collection. It was, was so from the beginning. It was designed by, um, by George Wharton because he wanted a training course for identifying mites. At that point, the big thing that they were looking for was chiggers. Uh, there was a lot of uh, chigger-borne diseases out there, and chiggers were really hot in that time. So chiggers and ticks, later on they added agriculturally important mites, and we now added some uh, soil mites too. Uh, so George started this whole thing at, uh, at Duke, then he moved and took the entire collection with him to, well, the entire collection that was a, at that point probably a couple of hundred specimens, took him to Maryland where it, it grew a little bit more, and then in 61 it went to Ohio State when Wharton got the job of chairman of the entomology department. Um, initially at the Ag campus out there in Worcester, uh, then they moved out to the main campus when uh, entomology and zoology were fused together in, into one department with, again, George Wharton at the head. Um, they moved a couple more times in different buildings. This collection has moved a lot. And now we ended up in a new building in the early 90s, a um, rebuilt food facility which may not sound too good, but it's actually been fantastic for the biological collections. We are off campus, which I find fantastic, uh, because we don't have the pressure of everybody else wanting off space. And we actually have space. You, know? you can sort of see a little bit here. We have space. Uh, that's one thing I'm not complaining about. Um, so we did one other thing for my collections. My collections have a tendency, if they're in universities, you get one person that works on mites, that builds this up, maybe two people, then they retire, and the mite collection goes in storage. We heard this earlier for uh, Kansas, which has a, was a great center for agrology, and is now pretty well closed. Same thing for the University of Georgia at one time, had three agrologists, they have none now. The whole, group, the whole thing is, is closed down. Uh, Ohio State has been different. I'm the number three, after George Wharton, uh, and uh, Don Johnson, I'm the third curator. There's actually continuity in, uh, in this place. Uh, Size-wise, what we have is, I still call it a medium-sized collection. We cannot compete with things like the USNM or the Canadian National Collections. Those are just much, much bigger. Uh, about 120,000 slides, 15,000 fluid lots. Um, Again, it's a teaching resource. It's used for the Agrology Summer Program, which is a set of workshops we use for training people in identifying mites. And we've been doing this now for 60 plus years. That's one of my big jobs, is organizing uh, that thing. Um, that has a number of consequences for the collection. During the, those workshops, pretty well anything I have in the collection, other than holotypes, can be taken out and used by everybody that comes in. And this is a lot of amateurs. These are not all. A lot of them are really good, and a lot of them have to learn. So this collection gets, there's a lot of pressure on it. I mean, I've had times when I took pictures of the collection when 
now 25 to 35% of my slide boxes are somewhere else. Uh, that's a bit of pressure on the, on the, the system. Um, the other thing, of course, is uh, diversity of groups. I have to teach everything, or we have to cover everything, so there's no focus. Other groups focus on agricultural important mites, on ticks, or something in that order. I want everything. Uh, and in that, I'm willing to compete with any acrology collection pretty well in the world. Uh, we have, I would guess, about 70 to 75 percent of, representative of 70 to 75 percent of the mite family, which is pretty good given that a lot of these families are one or two species. Um, also, because of the workshop and because of lots of guest lecturers, we get a lot of people that donate material, which helps immensely. It uh, has helped <coughs> enormously for secondary types. We have a lot of paratypes. Uh, Don Johnson, my predecessor, did not believe in holotypes in university collections, so he didn't want them. Um, <coughs> I can't see why we can't have them. I mean, so we have secondary type paratypes, about 3,000, 3, 3,500, about 120 holotypes. So it's a, it's a moderate collection. <laughs> Secondary collections, um, we have a separate insect collection uh, run by Noam Johnson, and he doesn't want anything that has more than six legs. So I get those. Um, we have a good spider collection, and we will get a much better one, and actually one that would be really nice for this project in that we get the entire collections of the Ohio Spider Survey, which is a really intensive survey uh, of the state of Ohio, uh, but they are being brought in our collection in small pieces. We also have a reasonably good scorpion collection, but uh, next to nothing in the target area that we're looking at. Oh, one last thing that I should mention, uh, the nature of the, the collection, um, it's not regional. Uh, it's about 40% U.S. or North America. The rest is the rest of the world. Uh, for my collections, you do not, at least for our style, my collections, we do not specialize. Uh, I want stuff from everywhere. Uh, we have been working quite a bit on databasing. In fact, uh, I started when I got the job, started on an old biota file. Uh, just for anything new that was coming in. And then uh, we got an NSF uh, collections grant after a couple of tries that I had on going for the facilities. They didn't like that. Uh, we went electronic, and I ganged up with Noam Johnson, who has a really nice and functional and NSF-funded system, which all of these things help, by the way. Um, and we started retroactive uh, databasing of the entire slide collection and a chunk of the, the fluid. Um, so most of it is now database-based. Uh, nearly everything that comes in now gets uh, barcoded. Uh, I'm following a rather convoluted system where I first run everything through, uh, uh, enter it into a FileMaker uh, file that I can no, there's a lot of incompletes in there. It doesn't really matter as long as it's in, as you have the data somewhere. And then once it's more or less processed, it goes uh, to Norm Johnson's system, which is the direct online system. Uh, what, which means that virtually everything that I have or in the, the main thing is already online in that uh, URL. We do not have images. And there's a bunch of things that I would like to add that I haven't gotten to, and then I want to use the invert net uh, to help with that. Uh, file maker files, the usual stuff that uh, uh, we, all of you probably have seen plenty of. Um, this thing has been a saving grace up there. Uh, the data as it is on the slide, no changes whatsoever, only that. Uh, it's a wonderful thing because later on you have to reinterpret what all of this meant, and sometimes you have to change your mind, and it's really nice to have the original. Uh, also, a really nice feature that, uh, that uh, the data manager that I had at that time put in was just putting in maps because we've had so often that we 
messed up with georeferencing. Everything, by the way, that went through the, goes in the database is georeferenced up to a point. You will find a good number of records where the georeferencing is for us, and there's a very good reason for it. I have no idea where that specimen came from. This is a screenshot from the online system uh, that we have. So we have now 277 families in there, uh, a little over 3,000 species. Uh, this system, Norm, developed this really for uh, georeferencing. That was his big thing. So that's what we've been pushing extremely heavily. Uh, we don't have much in the way of literature, uh, all that kind of things we do. And that was one of the things that I wanted. I wanted associations. That was something not everybody, associations and habitats. Ideally, what I wanted was somebody to go to my website and say, hey, what have you found in, on tomatoes in greenhouses? And if you think about that a little bit more, you probably realize, oh god, that's a horrible thing to have to try and coat all your specimens for, which we're beginning to find out. But it's still, at least in part, in there. Um, yeah, you can trace through the whole thing. This is one uh, fun take from uh, uh, Australia. The picture is not from Australia, that's from Sulawesi. Um, but no specimens, I I images. I really would love to have that, uh, even if it's not the spe actually the mite specimen, but at least the, the label uh, image or, or something in that, in that order. Uh, We've had a lot of problems, and we will get a lot of problems trying to use this in InfraNet, because a lot of my slides have just absolutely miserable data. I mean, it's criminal. I'm sorry. And I hate to say this, but uh, no. Things like this has a number on it, which you would think, hey, you can look up the number. Well, you would be wrong. Uh, that number is not always to be found. Uh, We've done an awful lot of detective work. Lots of it has been done now, so I'm feeling much better. But still, there are, as I said, there's a lot of things that we just can't do. And I cannot see any good reason to try and, and image slides where you can't extract anything useful. Um, we've gotten better. Uh, slides like this have what I really like. The nice barcode, the actual human readable number on top of that, because I'm one of these people with, with uh, uh, a belt and suspenders if it comes to collections, I'd rather have doubles. Um, and complete, uh, complete data uh, on it. But we still have a lot more to do for this one. Uh, we'd like to get more images, so that, that adds to it. Uh, and I would. Uh, want to keep, keep on going, and this gives me the opportunity to keep on going with uh, the material that hasn't been worked over yet. All right, Crustacea. Uh, this uh, Crustacea presentation is going to be even shorter than the mic presentation, but on the bright side, we may actually make up some time. Um, I was kind of surprised this morning to hear that uh, the, uh, the Illinois Natural History uh, sort of collection 12 and a half thousand specimens, one of the bigger uh, freshwater crustacea collections. Wow, and then actually eight and a half thousand for us, is, that's, that ain't bad. And this is one of those collections that sadly has been in the back hall. It's there. We also have a worm collection. Nobody knows what that is. Uh, because there hasn't been any work really done on it. Um, so a collection, nearly all of the crayfish, nearly all of it regional. So this is definitely a collection that, in terms of uh, geographical spread, fits really well with the, the, the project. Um, it has been maintained by volunteers, and I'm mentioning specifically Roger Toma, because he has been working on this thing for a long time. And in fact, this collection is in good shape. It really is, even if it's not used all that, all that much, and if we, we don't have a, an actual formal curator. Uh, this is an image of it. Uh, you see that roll row there on the right side. Consider the same on the other side, and that's pretty well, that is the collection. It's long, it's deep, it's very difficult to work through, but it's all there. 
Um, organized by taxon in part, this is where I want to be, uh, and by collection site, which of course a lot of us do the same thing. You get a collection and they're all sitting together until you get the chance to process them. Um, this was a surprise for us. Actually, we found out that Roger had an Excel uh, database that has pretty well all of these collections in it. So we st certainly have a good start on it, on it um, working, working this thing over. By the way, everything here is in these nice, uh, nice plasticized cardboard boxes. And any moment I expect some fire inspector to come in and tell us, there shall not be such thing. And then we're in trouble. Um, there, is, there are some practical issues with the crustacea. There's some, we have a lot of these little jars that I want to really would like to get rid of. Uh, the labels are uh, often old and not com quite uh, clear. Uh, but Roger has actually already printed new jar labels for everything. So uh, what we kind of hope to do is grab the jars, take things out, take the images of labels and specimens, put them in a new jar, and ta-da, we're all, all uh, moving on and hopefully get, may even get some use out of this collection. So that's really where, uh, where we're going uh, for the Invert Nets uh, project. All right, that's it.